and greetings uh, from from sunny Cardiff. It's not just sunny in Edinburgh; it's sunny in Cardiff too, which is which is wonderful. It's a huge pleasure to be with you this afternoon to talk about leadership, um, uh, which is critically important, not just in COVID times, but in all times. I just want to start really by uh, being very clear that I'm here talking in a uh, capacity of being a researcher. Um, some of you will know I am a member of the International Council of Education Advisors to Scottish uh, Government, uh, first, and sec uh, first and Deputy Minister, and therefore I am not speaking in, in that capacity here. I think it's really important just to make that, that crystal clear. I'm speaking as a researcher, an independent researcher, and I'm going to be talking about leadership during COVID times, uh, what we've learned but also what the future might hold in terms of school leadership and, and leadership at all levels in the system. Uh, you will see that I've got uh, my own Twitter handle uh, on the first slide there, and it would be wonderful if you could tweet some nice things. That would be, that would be great. Um, but it'd be really useful to know some thoughts from you as we go, as we go through the session. As I say, you know, what I'm going to try to do today is, is not look backwards too much uh, over, over what's been a very difficult period for all leaders at all levels in all systems, but really to, to ask a very fundamental question about what do we know about leaders and leadership during COVID times, and what does the evidence tell us? Because as a researcher, uh, you'd expect me to say I'm very keen on the evidence, and there's, there's a lot of rhetoric around leadership and leadership in COVID-19 times, but I'm keen to share with you today, uh, for the first time actually, what we know internationally about what's been happening in schools in, in different parts of the world and what has happened to leadership globally as a result of this particular pandemic. Um, just to sort of, uh, this, is the only, this is the only paper that I will refer to and it's a, it's a very short paper and most importantly it's free to download. And I, I wrote this uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, I guess, in the sense of drawing upon the best evidence that we had about what was happening in schools uh, right, right there and then. Uh, and it's been downloaded, as you can see, many times. And it's, it's a short piece that just looks at the issues, the complexities, the challenges for leadership. Uh, in our schools and in our system during during COVID-19. So I'm highlighting simply to say if people uh, want to have a look at that very, like, it is a very short paper. <laughs> uh, it, it's not an academic paper as such, but it does really raise a few of the issues that I will touch upon today. So that's a sort of reference point uh, for, the, for the talk. I just wanted to start really with what we know. Uh, the evidence base on leadership, uh, school leadership, all sorts of leadership, is, is huge uh, internationally. And it's quite hard to work your way through it uh, to find out exactly what it is that we know. So I thought a really good starting point uh, would be to just re-emphasize what it is we categorically know about leadership, effective leadership in our schools and school system. The first thing that we categorically know is that uh, leaders can transform uh, organizations and can significantly reverse the fortunes of failing organizations. The international evidence shows that there is no example of any organizational turnaround, whether it's business or health or education, anywhere in the world without leadership being part of that driving force for change. Now, the question is, okay, what sort of leadership? And, and I'll come to that a little bit later when I talk about distributed leadership, which I think is very pertinent to the COVID uh, scenario. So, so we know that leadership is critical. It's probably, after teaching and learning, the most important thing that can raise achievement and attainment in, in schools. So, I guess the first big message from this talk is that leadership matters. It matters a huge amount. And we need to just recognize that in times of crisis, like COVID-19, it, it matters even more. 
coming back to my question, so what sort of leadership matters most? And and I guess, you know, if you go to any airport or any bookshop, um, when you can physically go to these places, uh, you will normally see a lot of books on leadership. And it's normally the sort of, I did it my way, uh, sort of accounts of, of what successful leadership looks like. And I guess we've got to be really cautious because there's a lot of what I call adjectives tival leadership about. In other words, you take an adjective, you put it in front of the word leadership and hey presto, you've got another leadership approach. And I think we've got to be really careful about uh, just simply proliferating new models of leadership by putting adjectives in front of the word leadership. So when I talk about distributed leadership, I guess I just need to underline that there is an evidence base on that and it's pretty categoric in that it highlights that when leadership is shared, which is what distributed leadership is, it's not delegation, I'll come to that a bit later, but when leadership is shared and, and is collaborative and is, I guess, stretched across an organisation, the potential for better outcomes is a lot higher. Uh, and that's what I mean by distributed leadership. It's about building leadership capacity within, between and across organisations and with, within systems. But that takes me, I guess, to the third thing that we, we know. Uh, our best school leaders, um, our best principals, uh, first and foremost, understand their context. Now, that seems a very glib thing to say. Of course, they understand their context, but they understand it deeply and they understand it well. And when you see leaders who are less successful, often they really don't understand the context. They don't really engage with that context in any deep and meaningful way. So leadership is ultimately contextually bound. Um, and so for working with context, understanding context is critically important, which takes me to COVID-19. The context for leadership shifted dramatically during COVID times in, a, in an unpredictable way that, that no one could have really foreseen. So suddenly leadership goes into uh, crisis mode, whether whichever organization you were in, that, that was the situation for leaders and even more so in, in schools because of the responsibilities to young people, to communities, to families. So the context shifted so dramatically that in a way, everything we knew about leadership up to that point became a bit contested because suddenly we were in brand new territory where there were no blueprints, there were no ring binders, there were no courses. We were thrown into this form of chaos and leaders at all levels, and I keep on saying at all levels in the system, have to make some sense of that. So that change in context changed leadership practices. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the way in which that context dramatically shifted. Not all leadership practices, because some remain you know, really important, like moral leadership. But the practices that we use during COVID times did shift. So a little bit more about that. So here we go in terms of the context. Um, and I, I think this was a perfect storm with imperfect leadership responses. And, and Steve Mumby, whose name you might know, has written a fantastic book called Imperfect Leadership. And I think that in a way that underlines everything about leadership that has happened during COVID times and hopefully post-COVID times, if that's what we're in. You know, there, there, was, there was nothing to hold on to other than a sense that we had to provide some stability, some direction, some reassurance in the system. And I guess the image for me uh, as a leader in a university was that we were walking uh, on a tightrope without a safety net. Uh, and there was, there was nothing to help us really other than our collective wisdom and effort and our collective, I guess, drive to make things as good as they could be under the circumstances we were facing. Now, we've never been in that position before in, in contemporary times. Um, most of the, the writing about leadership has been uh, undertaken during very stable times where things are fairly predictable and, you know, the routine business of school goes on. Suddenly in COVID, all that fell away and leadership was exposed for the first time as not having 
too many uh, stabilizers and too many things it could it could actually um, rely upon. So that's the sort of the, the the context that leaders were living in, and most of you, all of you, I guess, can recognise that. So the con context matters. Leadership matters. Context matters. But what we've seen is that some of the leadership practices that have emerged during COVID or have changed during COVID or have evolved during COVID um, may continue to exist post-COVID because some of the ways of leading were frankly better than in pre-COVID days. And I'll say a little bit about that. Um, the evidence that we have internationally would say that there was a shift in leadership practices during COVID time. And that was out of necessity, absolutely. But the shift that has occurred in many respects, you could argue is more beneficial for organizations than what went before it. And we hear a lot about, you know, going back, going backwards, going back to pre-COVID times. And my question is, why would we want to do that? Because as a system, you know, Scotland has learned a huge amount. As a system, Wales has learned a great, uh, a huge amount too. And our leadership practices have changed, become refined. And in a way, our leadership practices in schools, as I'll explain in a moment, are well, uh, much more tuned to those you would expect that would lead to school improvement, organisational transformation and change. So let's not try and go backwards. Let's learn from what as we've experienced and in a way move forward with some of these new leadership practices or some practices that have been refined during COVID actually helping us to do better as leaders and to, to build the leadership capacity in the system um, so that you know everybody, all boats are lifted. So here are my, my three questions that I mean, you've asked me some very hard questions actually. Um, and these are my, my, my three questions and the first question is, what have been the challenges? Now, some of this will be more than familiar to you, but it's, it's important just to highlight, I think, you know, what were the challenges? They were many. Uh, they were relentless. Um, they were unpredictable. And that caused a huge, huge tension in the system, which I'll talk about in a moment. I've talked a little bit about the leadership practices and the way that they've changed. And I think we, we are now seeing evidence of changing leadership practices in, in different countries, in different systems. So you could actually argue that COVID-19, uh, as difficult as it was, has actually become a catalyst for some good things. And, and I would argue that the changing leadership practices that we see are largely, you know, unless they're reactive, a pretty good uh, collaborative, powerful, distributed models of leadership that are community focused. And then I'd like to sort of just talk about, well, what are the implications then? Because, I mean, it's, it's very easy to look back and, 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 I guess, look at the terrain that we've covered. But what, what lies ahead? Because for a system like Scotland, that, that is always the question that we are asked as international advisors, you know, how do we get better? How do we improve? What's next? And they, the, those are absolutely the right questions to be asking. I think if I just touch upon some of the challenges uh, for leaders, okay, um, what we saw and what we've seen in the evidence is that there were particular challenges around student learning. And I'm not going to read the slide, but it, it was absolutely clear that the challenges of learning within a pandemic were acute for certain young people and uniformly difficult, I think, in different ways for all students. And while in the grey box there, you know, there are some things that we've learned about managing the complexity of online learning, remote learning during a pandemic, it still remains the case that for some young people, uh, you know, the legacy of COVID just goes on. And the challenge is therefore in schools to, to ensure that every child uh, is successful uh, is, is still quite a challenge. And I know that schools are working on this and I'm, there's, there's no, I guess, view that that isn't at the forefront of your mind. It clearly is. 
But I think it's important to highlight that this was a challenge, that remote learning, you know, schools not being, not operating as they were, created all sorts of issues for young people, their learning, their mental health, their well-being. Again, those people who are school leaders and those people who are leaders in the system, uh, this would be very familiar territory. But it's important, I always think, to put the student at the heart of leadership and always ask the question, what difference is my leadership making to students, their learning, their attainment, their achievement? And this leads me to the second point, because what COVID-19 has done, I've done a lot of things, um, but one of the positive things it's done is it's, it's actually shone a light on equity. Because I think what we, we saw for the first time in very stark ways, the differences between young people, their access to technology, their access to the internet, their ability to find a space to learn and to, and to work. And I guess for the first time, uh, we, we know the effects of poverty on achievement. You know, I, I don't need to tell you that. But I think the spotlight on inequity was actually rather helpful because it's very easy to dismiss equity and equality and look at excellence as the priority. But I think for the first time, I think this pandemic showed that you can have excellence, but it has to be through equity. In other words, equity is the thing to tackle now and hopefully excellence will follow. So, I mean, there is a question later about equity and how we as leaders manage that. But I think it is really very much at the forefront of our, our, of our efforts at every level of the system, every child, every setting, success. Um, and then I guess, you know, the other thing that we've learned, and we always knew this too, is that how important communities are as a resource for school leaders. And that doesn't just mean parents, that means the, the broader, wider community. And, you know, our best schools have great community and parental links, uh, good parental engagement. But I think what COVID showed us is during, during the crisis, during the darkest days of COVID, it was the community around our schools that stepped up to work with the school, to be part of the solution. Um, imperfect though that may have been, um, it highlights the power that resides in community collaboration and it highlights the power of what happens when schools and communities, you know, whatever way they do it, work together. So let me just move on a little bit. And, and this, is, this is brand new and um, I have told Stephanie that I'm, I will share the paper uh, that this is based upon uh, for, for circulation more widely. But I guess the researcher in me wanted to ask, answer this question. So what does leadership look like in disrupted? What does leadership look like in a pandemic? And more importantly, what's the experience of leaders, school leaders, leaders within the system of, of trying to work in this way? One of the things that's absolutely clear from the evidence uh, is that during this time, and it will come as no surprise, was that leaders were under acute pressure and felt that uh, very strongly and, and in many respects still are. The unpredictability, the uncertainty, the U-turns, the changes, the, the different ways of managing this created huge emotional stress. So the first two parts of this diagram are related because the, the work intensification we saw, uh, not just in schools, but in other parts of the system because of COVID-19, meant that individual leaders uh, were under enormous pressure and that led to quite significant emotional stress. Now, I, I know in Scotland that you've been doing some blethers, I think, which is... I, I think it's to talk. I don't know what blair there is, but I think it's actually a chat uh, where you, you know, you've tried to, I guess, address some of the, the stress that young um, that that leaders have been facing. 
But I think we, what we can't do is underestimate what happened to leaders during this pandemic. And we, what we can't do is dismiss the most important finding, and that is the need for leaders to look after themselves first and to look after others second. So it's, again, highlighted the, the pivotal importance of leaders' well-being. Because sometimes in organisations, people tend to forget that leaders are human too, that they have their issues and problems during COVID, that they had families to look after. And I think there's that sense in which we've now recognised the importance of looking after our leaders and our teachers, because ultimately, if we look after our leaders and our teachers, then we look after our young people and we do better for them. In terms of the, the types of leadership we, we've seen across the world, um, I guess it's best described as adaptive leadership. There is no model, there is no COVID-19 leadership model, and, and I, I, I'd be very uh, worried if there was. But what we've seen is more of an adaptive sort of leadership uh, during the crisis, you know, adapting, adopting, trying, trying to manage an unmanageable situation through the best reserves you have of leadership. So adaptive leadership is what we've seen and it's probably the best way to describe the sort of responses to, to, to COVID. Personal resilience. Um, there, there's a lot of evidence around the personal resilience of, of, of leaders during COVID and the importance of that resilience uh, in managing the situation. But one of the things is absolutely clear is that that resilience has come from uh, a reliance on others. In other words, it's not just an inner resilience of, of coping with you know, huge crises, but actually it's a reaching out to others. And I think that's another lesson from COVID. Quite frankly, the job of a school leader is, is just too big for one person. I think we've, we've seen that time and time again. So if it is a positive that's come out of COVID, it's the importance of collaboration. It's the importance of shared leadership. It's the importance of saying to others, you know, I need your help. So that personal resistance only comes from a sense of, I guess, vulnerability and a sense of, you know, relying on others to help you make your way through. I've talked about equity and I've talked about family and community, but I, I just want to pause there because... One of the things we know from the evidence about um, improving schools is that family and community are very powerful lead levers when it comes to securing higher performance and achievement. And I think it's important to distinguish here the difference between uh, involvement and engagement. Involvement is participation and that's nice to have families and communities participating but we're really talking about engagement in learning and engagement with learners if you're hoping to see the improvement in outcomes uh, for all young people so yeah by all means you know reach out to the community but i think we're, we're talking here a different order of engagement that we've seen during covid times and is reported on you know, in, in various studies, that suddenly engaging with families in the community has been the top priority, not just nice to do, but absolutely necessary for survival, I guess. Um, the final thing just to, to highlight is uh, the evidence base is showing that there, there are changing leadership practices. In other words, during COVID times, people adapted, adopted, change their leadership practice because they had to. No longer were you, we, managing by meeting people and having a coffee. You know, everything suddenly went uh, online and became remote. And that in itself brought a huge number of challenges. But 16 months on, you know, we tend to use technology now in a very different way than we did pre-COVID, much more effectively much more smoothly. We know a lot more about online learning. We know a lot more about engaging young people in online learning. So that's been, a, I guess, one positive out, out of all of this. But the changing leadership practices, suddenly there were 
focused on leadership of learning, not leadership of the organization. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. One of the things that is, is absolutely clear, if the, if the job of the school leader, the principal, the head teacher is, is way too big for one person, then, then what's the solution? And I guess what we've seen through the COVID crisis is, is more distributed leadership out of necessity, you know, more shared, collaborative, network leadership, um, online primarily, to just get through the, the daily grind of, of managing the crisis. So suddenly we've seen models of leadership emerging that are way more connected, way more collaborative, way more creative and way more responsive. And I actually feel, uh, I don't know what you feel, but I actually feel that's a very you know, positive step forward because for so long we've talked about leaders collaborating with other leaders, and working with schools, and often what we see is low level cooperation. But I think this crisis has made, made it absolutely clear that high-level collaborative practice is probably the only way that schools have been able to function and to, you know, to retain a focus on, on learning for all learners. So distributed leadership, um, not delegation, shared leadership, recognising that sometimes the answers don't reside only in those people with the formal leadership roles. It's a much more empowering model of leadership that takes on board, an inclusive model that takes on board, you know, the expertise that resides everywhere in the school or everywhere in the university or everywhere in Scottish government, you know, borrowing and stealing every spare bit of leadership capacity to get through this crisis. That's what we've seen. Um, I've talked a little bit about equity and uh, again, I'm, ju I'm just going to sort of highlight the importance here of the relationship between not just the community but the wider stakeholders and I think where schools have managed this crisis very well they've reached out to the community to stakeholders in order to draw in I guess support expertise and guidance through, through a very difficult time. So what are the implications then as we as we look forward? Well the implications are that um, it's unlikely that we're going to enter calm, steady waters any time soon. It's unlikely we're going to return to the past because we've learned too much. We've developed too much as leaders. The practices have changed. We don't want to put all that good work back in the box for the sake of it. But I think that school leaders in the future and leaders at all levels in education systems um, will now be much more aware of crisis management um, and change management that is more to do with not the routine, um, I guess, pattern of, of schooling, but the unpredictability of what could be around the corner. I think it's raised the awareness of the possibility of not another pandemic, possibly, hopefully, but it's just set an alert for leaders at all levels in the system that wasn't there before. Um, I've talked about family support, so I won't, I won't touch on that again. So let, let, let me just finish, because I think I've spoken for my half an hour, with what I think some of the implications are. There's a big implication here for professional learning, a preparation, support for school leaders. Um, it is highly likely that a lot of what we did before in terms of the, in the name of professional learning and support for school leaders is now redundant because that context has changed so dramatically. That doesn't mean that everything has to be thrown out, but I'd like us to think a little bit more sharply about the forms of professional development and learning that support the sort of leadership that I've been talking about now and, I guess, prepare future leaders for being on alert, for dealing with a future crisis, for having those change management skills that you know, help them to move through um, periods of instability and unpredictability. So inevitably, I think, we will be looking at new programs um, that, will, that really will address you know, the, cu the current 
leadership demands and needs that I think are very different from the previous demands and needs. Um, this is the big implication. Most school leaders are still running on empty. Um, they've coped through the most difficult and challenging times and all credit to them. But I, I think as we move into a different phase of this, we can't just assume that everything is fine. The, the, the stress and the, I guess, the enormity of the personal sacrifices of which you'll know something individually that our school leaders have made um, haven't gone away. So there's something here about recognising um, the importance of self-care, but also the importance of, you know, well-being and putting them right at the top of the agenda. Um, and I would actually say put them at the top of the agenda and move accountability down. Because unless we have leaders who, whose own well-being is okay, whose own mental health is okay, then we've got a leader who is on the way to being burned out. So we have to invest in our school leaders, their well-being, their mental health as a priority. And I think, uh, and this is me saying this, not as a an education advisor to Scottish Government, but I think we've also got to take the pressure off a little bit. Um, the inspections, the accountabilities, you know, your school leaders are currently dealing with assessments as we come to the end of a school year. So I guess my big message is let's let's not just assume that everything is, is okay. Let's invest heavily in supporting our school leaders, wherever they are, in Scotland, in Wales, in the world and give them the support they need uh, for the job that they're currently doing and the job that they will be doing in the future. I guess my final word is, is the final word in that article. And, and it's, I, I guess it's a, it's a recognition of exactly what our school leaders have done during these traumatic times. You know, we stood on doorsteps and we applauded the NHS, rightfully so. But in many respects, I think we should have stood out there and also applauded our school leaders because the heavy lifting that they've done has been quite remarkable and will safeguard the future of so many young people through such a difficult time. So here's my virtual applause for all school leaders everywhere. And on that note, I, I will finish and uh, take any questions that you have. Thanks ever so much for listening. Thank you so much, Emma. So fabulous. Um, I'm sure a lot of the leaders on the call saw themselves, heard themselves in what you were describing there. And I just had a text actually from one of my colleagues to say that she felt really reassured actually by what you were saying. So thank you so much for that. What I've done is I've tried to categorise the questions a little bit, starting with where we are now and then leading towards the future facing questions. And there's a lot in the chat as well, so I'll try and bring that in as much as I can. I'll invite people to ask their own questions. Obviously, if they don't want yeah. to, I, I'll ask it on their behalf. I'll just give a brief pause to see if they want to come in. So the first question we've got is actually from Claire McDonald. Has we got Claire on the call there if you want to ask your question? That's fine, I can ask it for her. So we've got, um, how important do you think adaptive leadership and particularly growth mindset plays into being successful during such extreme circumstances as a leader? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I think I've already touched upon the importance of adaptive leadership. And I think, you know, Carol Dweck's work on growth mindsets is also pretty important because I think... If our school leaders did anything during the crisis, they, they, they kept a very positive focus on what could be achieved, not what couldn't be achieved. And I guess one of the one of the, the things that I get quite exercised by is the whole debate around learning loss, you know. And I'd like to talk about learning gains. What have, what have learners gained during during COVID? But I think the the practices of the most able and agile leaders have certainly been adaptive. And I think their mindsets, you know, the resilience I talked about, that's that sense of we can do, um, we will do, we will, we will carry on. 
um, has been enormously important. So I think, uh, Claire, you know, both those things uh, definitely speak to, to what the international literature is saying about school leadership during COVID. Stephanie, you're muted. Someone had to That had to happen at some point. Um, so I know you'd spoken about leaders working with the community in, in the widest sense during this kind of disruptive time. So the next question from Fiona is a really good one around relationships. I don't know if we have Fiona Patterson on the call. So the question is, how can we preserve the relationships we built pre-pandemic staff and parents when we plan to make more use of virtual mediums? Yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's a, re that's a really good question. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure it's about, I understand what the question focuses on, is, is, the, is the preservation of the relationships that were there before, and I guess they were forged in you know, face-to-face -face contact in parents coming into schools and all that has, has been restricted. But I think there's an opportunity here for engagement in, in a different way. And I think that preserving um, might actually lead to enhancing because the, I guess the, the, the technology allows engagement in a slightly, in a slightly different form. Um, so I would suggest that we can use this as an opportunity really to engage different parents in different ways i mean ultimately we're going to move to a hybrid model where there'll be some face-to-face -face, there'll be some online there'll be there'll be you know meetings in the in the way we used to have them but i think what the technology has done is opened up a new possibility for engaging parents in in a slightly different way and we've learned, I guess, through this pandemic about the power of communication like this and how those who are maybe reticent to come into a school or to talk to a head teacher or to talk to teachers might actually be more comfortable in, a, in an online environment. They may be, may be more familiar with that. So preserve at all costs. But I talk about enhancement and seeing technology as one way, one additional tool that you have in your armory to keep those relationships, but also to build upon them. And I suppose I'm just going to bring in very quickly a point that Jim made in the chat that I think is a good one while we're on the kind of point about digital. Jim sort of said, what system leadership do we need to prevent us talking about a digital the digital divide in 10 years time again so perhaps we haven't always known about that digital divide pre-pandemic but we do now so how do we prevent us talking about it for the next 10 years if you've got any thoughts on that one well i mean i guess the the simple answer is we've got to resource it we've got we've, if we know it's there we can't ignore it and that's what i meant about you know shining lights on, on on differences we always knew there was an equity we always knew that certain young people you know had different levels of resourcing than others i mean that's we've known that forever but i think that what we've seen during covid times is the ability to to level that playing field a little bit through additional resources and if we know that that is critical for young people to learn, then quite frankly, that has to be a top priority in terms of in terms of funding. Um, we know that that there are barriers to success for many young people, but if technology is just one of them, and this is the one that we can actually sort out uh, through extra resourcing you know, putting laptops into every school, you know, there were all sorts of ways in which schools dealt with this, you know. So I think it's within our gift to resolve this because it needs to be resolved, because there, there needs to be not just equality of opportunity, but there has to be equity as well so that every child succeeds in Scotland and every child succeeds, you know, in other countries too. So if technology is the barrier, then let's sort it. Let's put money in and let's invest in it. Um, 
I don't want to say Scottish government, you should invest in, in technology, but it's, it seems to me if that's what's getting in the way of learning, that's what needs to be invested in. Thank you. Um, we've had quite a few questions around what you see to be the greatest lesson we can um, take as we move forward, but I'd like to kind of add to that with a, another point that Jim's made. He's in, he's in top form on the chat here. Jim, I don't know if you want to come in and just explain a wee bit more about the, about lessons being ignored, if you want to talk us through that point. Yeah, hello there, Anne. Well, yeah, it, it was just, oh. that, just that thought that um, really what is to stop the system? You know, once we get back full time to that kind of face to face teaching, um, what's to stop the system from simply, uh, simply is the wrong word, I shouldn't use the word simply, but from really ignoring a lot of those valuable lessons that have been learned during the pandemic, you know, in that rush to say, look, we're back to normal, we're back to face-to-face -face teaching, it's what learners want, it's what teachers want, it's what parents want, et cetera, et cetera. And we, in some shape or form, um, just really don't, don't, don't pay enough attention to, um, uh, you know, some, huh, I hate to use the word positive as well, but some of the positive elements of, um, of learning and teaching in this period. Yeah, and I, I think, Jim, you know, everybody um, likes to default to normative practice. You know, we feel very secure in doing what we did. And, I mean, that that is the danger, right? and I think it's a real danger, because then we lose everything that we've learned and everything that we've, we've gained. Um, so I think it's a case of, what, what you know, what will we take forward or what should we take forward? And I think the one the one big thing we should take forward is the power of collaboration. Um, when it works well, it works incredibly well. And I'm not talking about cooperation. I'm talking about collaboration, and the recognition that there are you know if we can network within it. You know, Scotland is a, is a relatively small system like Wales. You know, we've got we've got real opportunities to connect more with each other than we ever did before COVID-19, because we've learned how to do it, okay? Now, we throw away that at our peril. We throw away the opportunity to network with each other. We throw away the opportunity to uh, gain, you know, from other people's expertise. So I think the, the one big lesson for the system, and, and I know Scotland, you know, has invested hugely in collaboration in the RICs etc but I, I think th this has taken it to a different level where the necessity has driven collaboration and I think I really do think and we know this from the research evidence of course it's such a powerful lever for school and system improvement that if we if we go backwards and lose that we've we've lost uh, something rather significant in the system thank you We've got a great um, kind of comment and question from Campbell in the chat. Campbell, I don't know if you want to come in. I've turned the cameras back on, so if you want to get the camera on as well, that would be fine. But do you want to come in and kind of make your point there? I'll, I'll save you the, the horrors of me on camera. <laughs> uh, so just lots of work and investment by government around Columba 1400 values-based leadership and as a head teacher at a big school just south of Edinburgh, eh, the same as everybody else, huge amount of uncertainty, eh, lack of information, lack of clarity, and and it was the a strong values base that we made explicit that actually helped us make sound decisions eh, during that time. Now, I, I was just wondering what your thoughts were around the importance of values, Alma, within the context yep. of everything that you've said. Th thanks, um, Campbell. I mean, I, I, I think it's incredibly important. I think, you know, in a crisis such as this, people go go back to, well, well, what will we go to the wire for? What matters most of all? It's, it's allowed people to look at their, their values, but more than that, it, it's, it's asked of school leaders, where do you set your moral compass? What's most important? And Campbell, you're right that, you know, there was a lot of uh, information coming from various sources that sometimes w was contradictory and sometimes was confusing and sometimes was, you know, blatantly unhelpful. And I think school leaders navigated their way through that by holding firm yep. onto what mattered most to them. 
you know. And, and I guess what kept them awake at night might have been the unpredictability of the situation and the, 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 the contradictory sort of guidance they might have been getting. But I think what continually reassured them was that what they were doing was the right thing for those learners in that context, those families, that community. So I, I think that, again, if anything good has come out of this whole crisis is if we can talk way more about values and way more about moral purpose than we do about accountability and data, then uh, I think we've, we've made a major step forward. Thank you both. Now I'm just adding there that he heard a nice alternative to the phrase build back better. Instead of that, have build forward differently. I suppose the other one I've heard is instead of bounce back, bounce forward. So I think that was really captured in what you discussed there as well. Um, kind of linked to values, it might be an ideal opportunity to bring in the next question, which is, you know, what do you see as the, the place and the impact of social justice at the forefront of leadership? So, you know, you talked about all the different types, adaptive leadership, social justice leadership. What are your views on that? Well, I, th I think I, I prefer called leadership for social justice, and I think it encompasses a focus on equity and a focus on, you know, who matters most, what matters most. So the values are in there, the moral purpose is in there too. And, I mean, essentially, leadership now has moved away from being a sort of technical activity, you know, where you learn to do certain things, to being primarily an emotional, moral, values-based activity, which is exactly where it, it, it should be. I mean, Martin Luther King did not say, I, I have a strategic plan, did he? Uh, and I think the important thing here is the message that, you know, at the heart of real, really strong leaders it is a moral purpose and, and a value-based position. And if you believe that every child, as I do, every child uh, should have the same opportunity, the same success, irrespective of background, then leadership for social justice takes us to a place where we need to privilege that and we need to start to dismantle the barriers that we see within our organisations that get in the way uh, of achievement for certain young people. Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. It, it's a lot easier to do the technical parts of being a school leader than it is to do the emotional, values-based, moral parts. But ultimately, it's the values-based, moral parts that make the difference to young people and their communities. Um, people won't remember what you said, but they remember how you treated them. And I guess what well, my advice to leaders around the social justice agenda, and it'll come as no surprise, is, you know, to notice, to act and to care. And I think that's what social justice leadership is, with activism right at the heart of it. Let's dismantle some of those barriers whenever and, and when we can. They may not be on our gift to dismantle, but I think the social justice aspect at least allows us to look for them and to recognise them when they're there. Um, thank you, Alma. You've spoken a lot about equity already, although I'm going to bring in my colleague Mary Ann. She's got a great question about your kind of top three priorities there. So Mary Ann, do you want to come in? Mary Ann, help me. Oh, she's no sound. That's fine, Mariana. I'll meet out for you. So, although we've spoken about equity, we're kind of drilling down a wee bit, I suppose. So, what are your top three changes or considerations that leaders will need to make post-pandemic to really achieve that equity um, in the practical sense? Yeah, and I, I, I think I've, I've touched upon those already, really. And um, I, I think it, it's about the... The, I don't think leaders need to change their practice. Um, I don't think there's additional things that they need to do. It's, it's almost a recalibration, you know, like putting the values part, the moral purpose part at the, at the heart of what they do. And then if you, if that happens, then an equity becomes a, 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 you know, an obvious target. I mean, what we know from 
looking at different countries is um, that if you get equity right, then achievement follows. And I think the mistake that many countries have made, not Scotland or Wales, is that they've put achievement before equity and focused all their energies on raising achievement often at, you know, a cost without focusing on what that what that means for young people in certain settings. So I think if we can address and break down the barriers uh, that accompany inequity, we've got a much greater chance of uh, improving achievement. Because if you think about it, logically, um, you know, talent uh, doesn't really take account of postcodes. It doesn't take account of the colour of your skin. It doesn't take account of where you live. It doesn't take account of if you're in poverty or in, in affluence. Talent is talent. And I think the, the real challenge for leadership for social justice is to ensure that talented young people, and there are many of them in our schools right now, are not disadvantaged by virtue of some of the barriers that are erected around them. And I think the school is the greatest leveller and the greatest, I think, uh, door to reducing inequities in our system. So again, school leaders play a huge part in that, as to teachers, as to the community. But the school, the school leader sets that moral compass about what is important um, and, and what they'll go to the wire for. Thanks, Emma. We've got two more questions here, unless we get any more in the chat. So the second last question we've got is, how do we embed distributed leadership practices and prevent them from being done in a really haphazard way? So it's only done in certain schools. How do we ensure that that distributed model of leadership is embedded throughout the Scottish education system? Um, yeah, and, and I guess, you know, often I get asked, can you, can you give us a blueprint? And I'm always very reluctant to do that because... You know, a distributed leadership model will vary from school to school, and that's not a cop-out. That's simply saying, you know, expertise varies. Um, there, 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 there's a different context, etc. I mean, I think the important thing is to recognise the difference between distributed leadership and delegation, because often when the model goes wrong is that people simply think, think that distributed leadership is just, you know, delegating out the leadership work to others, and that's that's not what it is. In fact, it's the antithesis of what it is. The way to answer that question is to say, always ask yourself as a leader, who is best placed to help me with this problem, with this issue? And it may not be the usual suspects. It may not be anybody in your senior leadership team. And that's what distributed leadership means. It means going to someone who has the expertise, the knowledge, not the position or role, to help you to solve a particular set of problems. Um, so distributed leadership will vary depending on the school, depending on the context, but the principles are recognising that expertise rather than role is important and that through effective collaboration and teamwork, there's more chance of in improving schools and we know that from the evidence. And distributed leadership, when it's done well and it's done properly, and of course the formal leader has a role in this, in, in making it happen and allowing it to happen, um, the collaborative nature of that work will inevitably mean more engagement in, in leadership. And if leadership is influenced, that means more engagement in influencing outcomes for young people. Great, thanks, Amma. Our final question, I don't think our colleague's actually here to ask it himself, so we'll try and do it justice on his behalf. Um, we've got a question here. Is true head teacher empowerment a realistic aim in the current Scottish education system? Um, it should be, simple as that, because everything I've just said speaks to a system that has been kept afloat because of the power of the leaders in our schools. So teacher empowerment and head teacher empowerment, I mean, it's not a case of someone empowering them. It's, it's a case of having a set of conditions within the system that naturally allow those people to be empowered. So I think there's a real tension in any system between challenge and support 
you know if you over challenge then you demoralize if you over support then you know the chances are that things might not go in the direction you want so getting a balance between challenge and support in the system is one way of empowering the right sort of challenge at the right sort of level but also the right sort of support and that takes me to my last slide um I'll put my penultimate slide about the support that we now need in the system for school leaders uh, to recover a little bit um, and to, I guess, regroup a little bit as we take the, you know, the next step forward. So I'm not sure if I answered the question, but of course, teacher empowerment, head teacher empowerment is important. But let's make sure, and I'll say this in a coded way, um, let's make sure it's authentic empowerment with the opportunity to actually demonstrate what can be done when um, the lead is taken in the system by those sitting in our schools. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect line to leave it on, authentic empowerment indeed. So Emma, I'd just like to say thank you so much for giving up your time to come along today. I know you're a very busy woman, so really, really appreciate it. And also to all our colleagues um, on the call as well. I know it's been a long day likely, so thank you so much for coming along and engaging with us.